following program is brought to you in living color on NBC. From Hollywood, The Tonight Show, starring Johnny Carson. This is Ed McMahon, along with Doc Severinsen and the NBC Orchestra, inviting you to join Johnny and his guests, Rich Little, Helen Reddy, Cornell University astronomer Carl Sagan, and trainer of dumb dogs, Matthew Margolin. And now, here's Johnny. Keep it up. I need your love to keep me warm. The thermostat is... Down. We set it at 68 in here tonight. Right. NBC has set it. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a comedy stick-up. Your laughter or your life? <laughs> you like to do that some night with a gun? <laughs> no. Wait, now, I hope you're good tonight, because last night we had uh, How would you describe them? Tough? Well, strange. <laughs> No, they were tough. I mean, you know you're in trouble when you walk out and you see pee-pee, people. <laughs> <laughs> when you see pee-pee, people. <laughs> when you see people holding up signs that said, impeach Pat Boone. That's a <laughs> nasty audience. Uh, things were going so bad last night. The right to middle of monologue, I saw Merv Griffin's life flash before my eyes. <laughs> No, no, I make a joke. We're good friends. I like Murif. Uh, he's got, I'm one of his biggest fans. He's got a show tonight. I wish I could have seen. I really? missed it. He's doing one of those theme shows that Murph does. He's on location in Sun City with five senior citizens and their proctologists. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry I missed that one. <laughs> Speaking of that, reminds me of being here in Burbank. Um, well, Burbank, we have a lot of senior citizens, wouldn't you say, in Burbank? Right, yes. Have you seen the Christmas decorations? Oh. Burbank's the only city that puts up orthopedic stockings on the chimney. Not <laughs> <laughs> <Santa Claus. laughs> We have an um, interesting gentleman on the show tonight, uh, Dr. Carl Sagan, who is an uh, astronomer at Cornell University. Have you, and we're going to talk about flying saucers and a lot of things, life on other planets. He's got a fascinating book called Cosmic Consciousness. But have you noticed lately... Is that, is that for consciousness? Uh, or we're in the cosmos, but have you noticed lately we have not seen many flying saucers? No. Remember about six or seven weeks ago, everybody was reporting a saucer every other day? But you know what happened? The aliens went home to their other planet, and they reported what was going on in Washington, and they put them away on their other planet. <laughs> Said, we ain't going back there. <laughs> uh, well, let's see, what's the latest on the tape situation? This is not easy to keep up with. Um, <laughs> Did you see the picture in the paper today that showed how the president's secretary, Rosemary Wood, my, might have erased the tape? She had to do a backflip. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. And Judge Sirica is getting a little steamed. I understand he's going to subpoena Mrs. Olson. <laughs> He figured she had to be in the room. Somebody had to be in the Mrs. Olsen was there. How are you feeling? How are you holding Great. up? Great. Fine, thank you. You're looking good. good. I don't know how you do that commuting. Ed is commuting every day to Las Vegas where he's working. And, you know, uh... <laughs> oh, I'll explain what the, what the barking's about tonight. We have an unusual spot on the show for you with a bunch of dumb dogs. Yeah, really. We have a gentleman by the name of uh, Matthew Margolis. Or is it Margolis? Yes. <laughs> Select one you like. I said yes to both. I didn't. Margolis. Margolis, I believe. Or Margolis. Uh, he's a dog trainer. And uh, we got some of the members of our staff to volunteer their dogs that can do absolutely nothing. <laughs> Dumb dogs. <laughs> and Mr. Margolis is an instructor. And he's going to show people who have a dog that can't do anything. Very simple basics and how you can teach a dog in a very short period of time. Is that true? Yes. And those are those dumb dogs. We had to teach those dogs to bark. They didn't know how to bark. <laughs> anyway, you're commuting. And yes. because of the fuel shortage, they've canceled a lot of the flights right. to Vegas. And you're not on, I understand, one of the regular commercial airlines. 
uh, like Western or something like that. He's flying up with Wheatfield Airlines. <laughs> they recently merged with Trans Debris. <laughs> I mean, I wouldn't fly in that airline. <laughs> Wheatfield Airlines. Fly to dangerous skies of wheat fields? <laughs> I don't have a slogan. I, uh, I've never been on an airline where they retract the wheels while you're still on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> like that, huh? Uh, you want to hear the latest bad economic news? Yes. You think we know the country's in trouble, right? That's why we might as well laugh about it. <laughs> you can have a couple of laughs every night. I mean, it may carry us through, but... There's a hardwood uh, shortage. Right. And there's a steel shortage. Right. There is now a shortage of caskets <laughs> in the country. Now, that's bad news, folks, but according to... K that was on KNX Radio today. Right. Shortage of caskets. But look at it this way. Because of the fuel shortage, you do have a simple solution. You just put the deceased to, to, to an empty gasoline can. Because <laughs> <laughs> you don't have any gasoline either, you see. <laughs> I told you it was bad. <laughs> Wouldn't believe me. Tonight, along with Mr. Uh, Margolis, Margolis and our dumb dogs, we have, I mentioned Mr. Uh, Sagan from Cornell University. Should be fascinating. Uh, and we have Rich Little, probably the finest impressionist working today. Great singer. Helen Reddy is yeah. here tonight. Am I leaving anything out? That's it. All right, are the dogs next? Dogs are next. Dogs, dogs are next. We'll be with you in just <laughs> one. We've got a busy show tonight, so I guess we should get started. Yes. I'm looking forward to this. I've, I've a, never been able to do this. Could you ever train a dog? I've had a lot of dogs in my life, and I love them dearly. Yeah. But they just never did anything. No. I couldn't get them to sit, roll over, stand, or... lie down, anything. But they were lovely dogs. But uh, this gentleman, Mr. Margolis, is the um, founder of the National Institute of Dog Training. He's trained over 6,000 dogs, and he's the co-author of of good dog, bad dog. Hmm. And it's a book that teaches you to train your dog at home. Would you welcome, please, Matthew Margolis. <laughs> On the paper. <laughs> they have a giant newspaper over there for the band. Best. Heel, roll over, play dead. Uh, how are you, Matt? Oh, I think. Uh, what is it with people? Most most people feel absolutely inept when if they get a dog, and then they say, "I can't train it to do anything." Well, what's the problem? They don't know how. They don't know how. You know, they, well, that can cause a lot of problems right there, I suppose. They assume they can because they buy a dog, and then yeah. when it comes into the house and they say sit, and it doesn't sit, they go dumb dog. Yeah. And then you know they feel it's always the dog's fault. Do people make the mistake of? of thinking that dogs are like treating them like human beings, and they're not, right? Well, no, they make the mistake of it, and they humanize it by naming it. You know, there's certain names of the dogs are really funny. Uh, some people name the dog Morris, Irving, Charlie. Where's Morris now? <laughs> Thank you. That's Morris and Irving right there. In other words, they give them cute names, first of all. Right, and then you get the person who has a German Shepherd, and who names it Devil. Devil. King, Fang. And then you have one fellow who called me up and I said, what's his name? He goes, Warlord. Warlord. And I, you know, he, I said, how This is really an extension of their own personality a lot yeah, of times, isn't it? Really it really happens, you know, all the time. Yeah, how did you get started in this business? Uh, I took an aptitude test. 
The Federation... <laughs> Turned out you were good with dogs? It, the Federation of Jewish Philanthropists. Yeah. Uh, they give an interest aptitude value test. It's interesting. And one of the... Uh, there's about 5,000 questions, and they said, you want to be a doctor, lawyer, dentist, engineer, pioneer, <laughs> astronaut? Right. And one of the questions said, how would you like to train dogs for the blind? I said, training dogs, that's it. I just knew it. And I went out, and I formed this company, and it's been doing it for six years now. That's intriguing. Do people bring the dogs to you, and you take them away from the owner for a no, while? No, I go to the home. Go to the home They'll and teach them. call me up, and them. I'll visit the dog in, in the environment where he lives, and I'll not only teach the dog, but I'll teach the people. And that's the hardest part. Yeah. The biggest problem, I would guess, the people who have dogs is keeping them in the house. This is what I hear. They can't seem to train them. Housebreak. Yeah, housebreak the dog at all. It's yeah. funny. Um, it's such a tender subject, uh, especially when people call me up and say, my dog is not housebroken. Yeah. I said, how long have you had the dog? I said, three years. Three years and he's not housebroken. I said, why did you wait so long? I said, I thought every year would get better. <laughs> <laughs> and then I, what they describe housebreaking, like they'll say, I said to this woman, um, what does your dog do? She says, well, Poofy makes chocolates in the house. Poofy makes chocolates in the house. <laughs> They see right away there's a problem, isn't there? The lady cannot say what's she the problem. Say is. It and then, what are some other euphemisms um, for? Then one is it Horace left gifts. <laughs> Horace left gifts. <laughs> I had a dog like every day was Christmas for my dog, I remember. <laughs> Isn't that funny? They won't come out and say he uh, goes on the rug or whatever. And then one woman said, uh, Maxwell left surprises for me. Surprises. Yeah, they, the euphemisms are funny for things like that, but... Uh, then it's ah, ah, caca, wee, wee. Oh, all the things. All that, of them. They just won't say it. Yeah. So that's a big problem. Can the average dog be housebroken quite... In about three in a, days. In about three days. If they know what to do and how to do it, it's so simple. Now, dogs do not understand words per se. They connect a word with a reward or an action. Isn't that true? People think that... I mean, if you said to a dog, sit, you could as well say chair. Right. If you taught him to... Exactly. To do that. So they don't understand the words. No. It's the words combined with, with the, the action. action. Right. And then the reward is praise and love. You never, you never give a dog treats as a reward because you can't walk around with food all day long. Right. Now, people make a mistake, do they not, of, of talking to dogs sometimes, thinking that the dog understands what you're saying. Now, like, now, don't get up on the bed. Right. Now, the dog doesn't understand <laughs> don't get up on the bed, right? He'll understand down or off if you teach right. him those simple things. Right. But exactly. I've heard people say, and they'll keep changing it. I told you not to get up on the bed. <laughs> the dog, you see the dog going, uh... <laughs> but it's like they're talking to a human being. Exactly. You know, stay out of that room. <laughs> well, the dog doesn't know from that, right? But I, I tell them that and they say, but he knows. Yeah, they feel that the dog knows, don't they? And they yeah, and they don't want to ever be told that he doesn't know, because I think it's their child. In other words, you should have definite words, and those words should really never change. If it's sit, it's sit, or stay, or lie. Or down, or down, or no, or okay. Or come, and that's about it, isn't it? Yeah, and there's simple ways to teach them, but to really stick with those basic words, you can't go wrong. All right, now we have some dumb dogs. <laughs> At least the people, uh, I think we have, uh, well, we'll find out who the dogs are from. Some members of our staff have brought in their, their animals, which may be beyond help. Is there any such, is, there, is that old adage about you can't teach an old dog? Well, I've trained eight, nine-year-old dogs. There are some dogs that just can't respond, but I think 99% um, of the time they can. Right. All right. We're going to take a break here, but we're going to come right back, and we'll see how this works. I hope, hope you, this works, Matthew. We'll be right back. <laughs> I hope work. so, too. <laughs> talking with uh, Matthew Margolis. We were talking about dogs during the commercial. You said there are such things as neurotic dogs because the owners... The owners make them neurotic. 
They make dogs neurotic. They impose what they think is right on the dog, and the dog looks at them like they're crazy, and then the owner goes, well, that's how he really is. That's interesting. All right, let's go over, uh, Madeline, and see what we have here. Here we are at the dog training school. <laughs> Can we have the first dog? All right, it's the tag on this dog. Now, you see, is this the whole name of the dog? You see, right away, we got a problem. Is this Shirley's dog? This is one of Shirley, what? what? Whose dog is this? Well, this is the Bernstein dog, and he is, uh, works for Don Rickles, or? <laughs> now, you see, Dudley Rodney Wellington Bernstein is the dog's name. <laughs> Does anything he wants to, never listens. Well, but you see, right away, there's your problem. What do, what do you call him? Dudley? Dudley. All right. Come on, Doug. Now, what I'm going to try to do is teach Dudley to sit. Come on, Doug. And to heal, and maybe to stay in about two minutes. Come on, Doug. Come on, buddy. Hi. Come on, buddy. Hurry up. Hit it. Hit it. Stay. Much better. Stay. Nope. Stay. Good boy. Stay. Yep. That's better. Stay. Nope. Stay. Is that what you keep repeating that command? You keep your answer. Nope. Stay. What you really try to do is to make him aware of you. Hi. How are you? How you doing? Stay. You all right, Matthew? <laughs> Come on. That's a boy. How you doing? Come so you on. gotta get the contract. So what you really do, you kind of come up on this leash a little bit. You pull up on the leash and collar. And, and, and his hindquarters down. Right. And then you tell him to sit. Now he but well, he's very responsive. Come on, Doug. So what you can do, you can almost fool him. Hey. Shh. And I can just stop it. Never worked with this dog before? Never saw him before in my life. Did this dog do this before? Stay. Okay, Mr. Dudley. <laughs> okay, let's have our next tag. Next guest animal. <laughs> He didn't want to come out. I just read on the card, develop sexual attachment to humans. This is Louie. Louie, whose dog is this? This is Jerry Farrell's dog? Our stage manager. This is Jerry's dog, Louie. You see right away, Louie. L-O-O-E-Y. Like I spell Louie. Yeah, you can't even spell Louie. How's the dog supposed to know, Jerry? Where's Jerry? Okay, Louie Farrell. Uh, Develop sexual attachment to humans. Now, why don't you work? Uh, well, why don't you work? What do you mean, working? <laughs> Read the cards, silly. Uh, remember that old joke? Uh, uh, okay, come on, Louie. Uh, come on, let me show you how to hold it. Come on, Louie. Put your thumb right there. All right. Okay, Louie. All right, come on, come on, Louie. Come on. Okay. Louie, Louie, come here. Louie. All right, sit, sit. Louie, sit. Sit, stay. Louie, that's it, stay, 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 no, sit, 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 sit. Louie, sit, 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 sit,
Alaska. Now, is that that about it? You got to kind of talk with them. Yeah, the biggest thing is to communicate to them. Let them know you're happy. That's good. That's good, Lloyd. Okay, go back and have a good time. <laughs> okay, let's... Who's next? Who's talking to next? Okay. Hey. Easy, easy. Easy, easy, boy, until I find out... Ah, this is Pat McCormick's dog. There's his problem right there. <laughs> Pat's one of our writers who has been known to have his own problem himself. This is Alfie. And his problem is he's goofy and untrainable. Which I might say the owner is also. <laughs> All right, just can't, won't do a thing, Pat? Alfie. Alfie. What's it all about? <laughs> Alfie. All right, uh, Goofy on, on trainable. Come on, Al. Let's go, buddy. How are you? Heel. Good boy, Al. Out the heel. Good boy. S. S. Stay. Oh, no. No. Good boy. Stay. Much better. No. Come on. Stay. Good boy. Stay. Stay, 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 nope, stay, nope, good boy. In other stay. words, it's repetition, repeating the same act over nope. and over, and letting the dog know that sure. that's what he and or you can she even, is supposed to do. No, nope. you can even pull him. People think that the collar hurts, it does not hurt. Never. Do choke that. collar doesn't choke. This is a choke collar, I can, it doesn't. Shh. Drop your pants. <laughs> I know it's McCormick's dog if it does that. No, that's fine. You see, look at that. It's fine. Let's stay. He's excitable, so this is probably the hardest thing for him to do. Come on, Alfie. Come on. Come on. Good. Okay. That's good. 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 Stay. Good boy. Stay. Sometimes a hand, you feel... You can, you can use the hand yeah. and just say the word stay and they don't even have to use right. the word anymore. Stay. Okay, come on, come on, come on. That's good. Hey, all right, where's our next door? Come on, Alfie. Alfie. <laughs> okay, Alfie, Alfie. Okay. Want to take him off there. Aha. This is... Dolly or Hop? Dolly. Dolly Wood. We got a lot of strange people on our staff. This is, oh, this is a Shirley Wood who's been with our staff. Well, you see what she says? <laughs> Does a do in the den from time to time. <laughs> For those of you who weren't earlier before, that means leaves a chocolate on the rug. <laughs> Does a do in the den. Now, what, what do you do if a dog comes in and eliminates on the carpet? What, what's the first thing you do? Now, people say you rub their nose in it, you strike them with newspapers, well, you yell, you scream, you do all those things. Well, the thing, if, what, if he does that in front of you, you can correct it by just saying the word no. But you never rub his face in it, you never roll up a newspaper, you never hit a dog. Because they don't know what that's for, right? No, if he has water all day or excessive water, or he's a little nervous, he may do that out of nerves, and no matter how much you hit him or yelled at him, it would stop the problem. Right. Or if you never got rid of the odor, no matter what you right. did, so it's really, rather than punish him for what he's done wrong, the ideal thing is to teach him what to do right so you don't have to punish him. But suppose you do catch him and they've just done it. Then you say the word no, he'll stop. You take him right outside and then he'll finish. And then you or take him to a spot in the house that uh, with or if papers he's paper or trained, whatever. Right, if he's paper trained. But you don't strike them or rub their noses. You never hit a dog, never. If it worked, you'd never have to do it more than once. And it never oh, that's, that's a nice little dog. Aww. Aww. Do a do do. <laughs> Oh, I see. I don't want to teach him to do it on command. That's no good at all. So, in other words, if you... Now, suppose you don't catch him in the act. Dogs, their memory span, it's not enough, is it? Because I know people will find a dog that's done something on the carpet. They come back a half hour later, take the dog in and say no. But the dog doesn't... Ten seconds. You have, must do it within... Ten seconds. A very brief time, because the dog's memory span doesn't you, exist that long. Right. right, and what would happen if they came in, they usually say... What did you do, Dolly? What did you do, bad dog? And the dog looks so frightened. They go, aha, I knew he knew he, what he did wrong because when I said, what did you do? But that's the tone of the voice. Right, they frightened him so much that the dog cowered. And then what happened the next day, the I dog see. made the same mistake. And again, they think, aha, 
But it's really the fear that they did, not that they right. taught him anything right. But that's very interesting. But it shows you with a few little patience is the main thing. Exactly. Uh, and a uh, few simple commands. I thank you for being with us tonight. Oh, I enjoyed Thank it. you very much. You want to take down the A super show tonight. This I was just looking at this book by Mr. Margolis, and uh, it looks like about the most common sense book I've seen on training mm. dog. You know, he's good. good dog, bad dog. Uh, Rich Little is here tonight, and uh, also Helen Reddy and Dr. Carl Sagan, the uh, astronomer from uh, Cornell University, is here tonight. It should be a fascinating Great. night. Rich Little is probably the finest impressionist working today. He uh, opens at the Palmer House on December the fourth, and he's with us tonight. Would you welcome Mr. Rich Little? I wonder if you know, excuse me, I didn't mean to interrupt mm. you, but I wonder if you know that you do something, because you put me on the night of the Dean Martin roast about all my little nervous habits and takes and looks and so you forth. You mean you're going to do an impression of me? I'm going to tell you what you do, whether you don't know it. Freddie was talking with you because you're going to guest host this show one night later next month. And he says you stopped him in the hall today talking about guests. You know, just as Rich Little. And saying, you know, maybe I could get Jimmy Stewart because he'd make a firing. And you went right into everybody you talked about. And you mentioned Jack Benny. You're just talking to Freddie in the hall, saying maybe we can get Jack Benny. Because, you know, Jack would be a good guy. And you true. fell right into the people. I do that without thinking about it. You see? Yeah. That, that could be a strange multiple personality thing with you, couldn't it? Yeah. If you mention anybody <laughs> else. <laughs> see what happens? Hey, this is the first time I've ever followed a dog act. <laughs> <laughs> Sit. Stay. I've been on before Camel. I'm hip, yes. But that, that was the Ed Sullivan show. 
Um, <laughs> I understand you're going to do a reading tonight. You usually don't do readings, do you? Or poetry, I understand? Well, no, I, I didn't uh, write this like Victor Bruno does, but uh, every year I've done a version of it was The Night Before Christmas. This one's called The Night Before Watergate. How fortuitous. And uh, uh. it was written by a guy named Bob Hanley, a very clever actor-writer. And uh, it's, of course, Richard Nixon telling the story. <laughs> <laughs> It was a night before Christmas in our San Clemente house. Not a creature was stirring, not even a mouse. <laughs> the tapes, they were hidden by the chimney with care for fear that Sam Irvin soon would be there. Testing, one, two, three. <laughs> My lawyers were nestled, all snug in their beds, while visions of Sam Quinton danced in their heads. <laughs> Me in my nightgown and Pat and Chiffon had just finished turning the tape recorder on. <laughs> when out on the lawn there arose such a clatter, I sprang from my throne to see what was the matter. <laughs> driveway, I flew like a fool, forgetting that's where we just dug our pool. <laughs> <laughs> the leaves of the palm trees reflected the glow of the cornflakes pat whitewashed to simulate snow. <laughs> Very clever. When what to my wondering eyes should appear but the Watergate gang, is that perfectly clear? <laughs> And a little old leader, so lively he ran, I, I knew in a moment it must be Big Sam. More determined than Nader, his search party came, and he whistled and shouted and called them by name. Now Baker, now Gurney, Montoya and Dash, on Talmadge, on Wiker, let's move like a flash. <laughs> Rip up the floorboards, tear down the wall, now search away, search away, search away all. Sam spoke not a word, but went straight to his work, pulling out wires like a man gone berserk. <laughs> then laying a finger aside of his nose, a gesture I thought was a juvenile pose. <laughs> Up the chimney he rose. He sprang to his car and to his team gave a yell. Though they'd found not one tape, the place looked like hell. <laughs> but I heard them exclaim as they drove out of sight, Merry Christmas to all, and to you, Tricky Dick, it will be a truly silent night. <laughs> Yes. Possibilities are uh, rich. The White House for command performances <laughs> that, too often. That crossed my mind during the bit. Did, did you? Several uh, times, yes. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's very clever. Well, thank you. Very clever. Did you add, um, you try to add new, well, I know, of course you do. From time to time you come yeah. up with new, depending, you come up with things on the Urban Committee and various people that come into the, uh, the I'm public line all the time. I'm working on a buddy of uh, Ed's, Frank Sinatra. Sinatra. I've been trying to perfect Sinatra for years. It's a very not, hard not, voice to do. It's not easy to do. Harry Belafonte. Ooh. Back to back, belly to belly. Don't touch the dial, just look at my belly. <laughs> <laughs> or something. Uh, B.B. Rebozo, working on him. Who would know? <laughs> well, B.B. Rebozo sounds... Uh, Rebozo. He sounds a lot like uh, uh, Nixon, I guess. Hmm? He sounds... Uh, a lot like Howard Hughes. <laughs> uh, yeah, who would know? You could do anything for <laughs> Bibi Rebozo. Get a hand. I do some walks of people. Yeah, you um, 
One of the ones I love to do and never get a chance to do is Walter Matthau. You know what Walter? I just walk. Walter Matthau walking. <laughs> Last night, my wife ran off into an old flame of mine. I know there's nothing unusual about this except it was in the closet of our bedroom. <laughs> Jack Webb. <laughs> Walter Brennan. <laughs> Johnny Carson. Oh, come on now. Gibbons, come over to your house tomorrow and eat your window box. <laughs> All of them. Uh, John Wayne. John Wayne. Big yeah. Duke. Big Duke. <laughs> Yo. W.C. Fields. Yes. W.C. Fields, well. Ah, <laughs> uh, women are like elephants to me. I like to look at them, but I wouldn't want to own one. <laughs> Hubert Humphrey. <laughs> My fellow Americans, I'm just as punched as pleased to be here tonight. I was saying to my wife Muriel just the other day, I said Muriel, and she said, that's right. Well, Robert Mitchum's a little like uh, John Wayne, except that... Yeah, the walker. Mitchum's huh? Except that Robert, uh, you've got to stick is... the... The gut out. Robert Speak. Mitchum got us. Robert Mitchum is, uh... <laughs> yeah. Now, the it legs... Depends how, the how legs, tight the girdle is, yeah. you know. The legs come later. Yeah. The, yeah, legs the legs come, come later. Back here. Yeah, that's funny, you know. Oh. You forget that everybody outside of the voice have all of those physical characteristics about um, body movement. Well, you're the wildest. Well, you, you put me on that night, and I, I do lots of things. I have one hand behind me sometimes, both of them sometimes. Uh, you said I had 27 different... You have uh, 23, and uh, we found another one today, the blinking. I didn't do the blinking one. <laughs> I do that, too? You do the blinking, yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's 23. Now, Bob Hope's walk is the same as Jack Benny's. They each have a hint of mint in the walk. It's the, you know... Just, just, just a touch. Well, Jack is, you know. <laughs> now, Bob's is just a little bit faster. Bob's the same walk, but young. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And he sits down and does the same. Boom, boom, boom. How are you doing there? Hold down, boy. <laughs> yeah. Ed Wynn once said many years ago, and I suppose if you uh, analyze it uh, far enough, that all comedians, uh, physical comedians, have a certain uh, times effeminate mannerisms or characteristics because it works comedically whether it is a walk or a, a gesture or so forth and it's true if you analyze it far enough even wc feels a little walk is a very gingerly mm -hmm. type of walk it's almost effete in many ways but it works for comedy sometimes if you explore it is that every... what you do what yes that's what i walk very gingerly well john wayne you know imagine having a walk like that and his real name is marion morrison yeah but but who's gonna argue well, yeah. sir, nobody's going to argue with that pilgrim. <laughs> <laughs> pilgrim. <laughs> Let me take a break here. We'll come right back after a word, brief word, and then we shall return.
Ellen Reddy is with us tonight. She's a superb singer, and as you know, she starred in her own summer television series, and is well on her way to become, I think, the first artist besides the Beatles as a group who had uh, three number one records in a single year. She's going to do a couple of numbers for us, and I think uh, one of them is her uh, latest big hit called Leave Me Alone. Would you welcome, please, Miss Helen Reddy. <laughs> Taking its own sweet time And hasn't there been Some long, lonely nights When you didn't think That anything would turn out right Oh, oh, oh baby Come and lay
to that long way down. You are such a fine singer. Thank you. Really, it's great here. Two great numbers. Let me interrupt here, and we'll come back and talk in a second. We have a word from one of our sponsors, and we shall return. We're talking with uh, Helen Reddy. I understand, since, did you go back to Australia since when you finished your summer show? Is that when you yes, I was. Uh, we just got back from there uh, two weeks ago. We went, uh, well, I did a, a concert tour of the whole country and we played the yeah. uh, well, that, Opera But that's House. home. That must be a, a kick. Uh, well, it was my first uh, time back performing live in seven and a half years. I didn't realize until someone told me that you were performing when you were four. Mm-hmm. How did that Doing come about? Doing two a day. Well, um, my parents were both uh, theatricals. You know, my father was a comic and my mother was an actress. And uh, we were in, in Perth at the time, and I was in the night show as well, but my big number was in the pantomime in the afternoon. My, the roles are all reversed. The women play the male roles. Right. The, and my father played the uh, dame, and I was a plant in the audience. You know, there's one segment where they have the audience sing along with the screen and what have you. And... Uh, He'd say, would any little boy or girl from the audience like to come up? And I would rush up and I'd do the song. And then he'd say, you've never seen me before, have you, little girl? And I'd say, no, daddy, and kiss him. And well, no. I ran off into the wings. Four yes. years old. Hmm. 
Hmm. What would you do if somebody beat you up there? Well, it happened, that, that it happened once. My aunt and my grandmother had come all the way from Melbourne to see me, and I was most anxious to make a good impression. And two other kids beat me to the stage, and I was <laughs> livid. I mean, how dare they get up and do my act? That's funny. And uh, so I stood in back of them, and I just moved my lips. I refused to sing. I was outraged. And uh, my father let them do one chorus. Then he said, well, he said, you can go back to your seat. He said, but I couldn't hear this little girl in the back. We'd better have her do it all again on her own. That's so I, I got Four years old. Did you enjoy it, or were, were you so young at the time that you didn't really realize that you were performing in a way. I well, mean, I don't remember. Was it all just like a game? To I don't you? remember the first time that I walked on out on stage. There was never any sense of, oh, I'm up here and there's all those people. It was just something right. that I did. That's what but I I've meant always because loved it. At Bornham? Oh, yes, I think so. What's coming up for you now? Well, uh, I have a concert here in Los Angeles, December 11th, at the Dorothy Chandler Pavilion. Right. And uh, Christmas week, I'm going to be in Florida at the Doville. Yeah. It, with Joan Rivers. That should be great. Yeah, I'm looking great. forward to it. All right, we're going to take a short break here, and then uh, Dr. Carl Sagan from Cornell is going to join us. We're going to talk about some fascinating subjects right after this. Arrangements and promotional fees paid by United Airlines, now giving you extra storage space on board many short flights. My next guest is Dr. Carl Sagan, who is professor of astronomy and space sciences and director of the Laboratory for Planetary Studies at Cornell University. He's considered uh, astronomy's most articulate spokesman, and he is the author of, of a fascinating book called The Cosmic Connection, an Extraterrestrial Perspective. Would you welcome, please, Dr. Carl Sagan. I would guess, first of all, thank you for being here tonight. I get so many questions myself on what I ask you because I'm uh, a nut on this type of stuff, an amateur astronomer. And I would imagine that this time uh, in our life has got to be one of the most exciting times for people who deal with that because of what is happening. It is. Uh, with all the Pioneer space flights now and uh, Pioneer 10 is supposed to, what, 
come close to Jupiter de December, December the 3rd. Third, right. There's a flotilla of four Soviet spacecraft on their way to Mars right now. There's something called Mariner 10, which is on its way to, to Venus and Mercury. And there's something called Pioneer 11, which uh, may go to Saturn. In other words, all the planets, uh, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, have space vehicles headed out towards them at the present time. It's quite an extraordinary moment in, uh, it's gotta be. in learning about the solar system. Now, I imagine a question you, you get from a lot of uh, laymen constantly is, what the hell are we spending those millions and billions of dollars for uh, on that when we've got so many problems going on here? Why don't we solve our problems here? Then we'll go look at the other planets. And, but in the meantime, why don't we cool it? Yeah. Uh, how, how do you answer that? It's well, a legitimate question. Absolutely legitimate question. If scientists can't answer that, I don't think they should be able to spend public funds uh, to do what they do. First of all, I'd say that uh, there's a big difference between unmanned and manned spaceflight, and there's a big difference between what NASA spends and what Department of Defense spends. So just to, to make a, a cost comparison, uh, there was a proposed mission called uh, Grand Tour, which mm -hmm. was supposed to go out to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, explore the entire solar system in which we live for the first time, preliminary reconnaissance. Um, it, it is an opportunity which reoccurs every 176 years. The last chance to do it was when Thomas Jefferson was president. And the next time is sometime in the 21st century. We didn't do it because it was too expensive. How expensive was it? It was half the cost of the 1970 fiscal year cost overrun on the anti-ballistic missile system. So the accounting errors in the single weapon system the Department of Defense exceed the exploration of the whole solar system, which we couldn't afford to do. So in terms of cost, it seems to me right. it's, uh, it's something we can afford. In terms of value, I see a great many values in the exploration of the solar system. Um, first of all, there's the, the adventure of exploration. The Earth is all explored. There's no new places on the Earth. But here we are surrounded by, by other worlds. Uh, there was a time in the 15th and 16th century when people were exploring what was called the New World. That wasn't a new world, that was just here. Right. But these are really new worlds, and they're very different from here, and they can shed a great deal of light on the origin and evolution and future of, of our own planet. In other words, what you're saying is the discoveries that we might make there, or could make there, might in some way tell us how to live better here? Uh, Absolutely. For example, there's, uh, there's a bunch of sciences like uh, geology and biology and meteorology, which are in a, in a fundamental way stuck to the Earth. They only have examples here on Earth. Right. And that very greatly limits them. If those sciences were able to extend themselves by seeing what the weather is like on Venus, the geology on the moon, the biology, if there is any, on Jupiter, then they become extremely powerful sciences, and then they can work back here on Earth right. with more practical advantages. What would you like to see, if, assuming that when Pioneer 10 gets uh, within, what, 80,000 miles of the planet and that the radiation doesn't uh, destroy the whole thing, what would you like to see come back uh, from those pictures? Well, as you said, even if uh, you, we probably couldn't see any life at all from that distance, because if you had a spaceship, what, come 1,200 or even 1,500 miles above the Earth and right. took pictures and went back, they wouldn't see anything. Would on they, the Earth, that, that's that, right. They, on they, the Earth, that showed that... was lifeless. Yeah, only from, what, 1,500 miles or so? Yeah, we took a lot of pictures. We, we examined a lot of pictures of the Earth taken uh, by Earth satellites, and, uh, for example, we could find no sign of life, intelligent or otherwise, in Washington, D.C. <laughs> But that's only from a, a relatively short distance, right? I mean, you could see no man-made structures, and uh, people wouldn't go back and say, well, obviously, there's life there because we can see these things. That's right. It's not easy to detect life on the Earth, for example, by taking a photograph of it. And uh, Pioneer 10 is, is not designed to be a uh, life detection mission, right. nor, nor is it designed primarily to be a photographic mission. It's the first kind of penetration to the vicinity of Jupiter to find out if it's safe to go by there to answer some fundamental questions. And uh, I think the Ames Research Center of NASA, which has organized that mission, has done a very good first job. But it's just the very first step. And you want to go with Mariner-class spacecraft and, uh, and just do better jobs in, in future years. And NASA right. has plans to do that. I found the book absolutely fascinating because I think everyone uh, has an interest in, in space because, first of all, it boggles the mind. And I assume in astronomy, the more you find out, the more questions that you, it opens up. Every time you discover something, that just don't, opens it up a little further and become more and more confused. But I suppose everybody would like, in a way, to hope, and although I know some people who hope they don't find life on other planets because they seem threatened by it. Mm -hmm. And that brings us to the, all the extra 
the, the sightings of the space objects, or UFOs, as they're commonly called. I saw you on one show one night, and you didn't think they were from probably other planets because there wasn't any what you call hardcore scientific evidence, mm -hmm. unquote. Uh, why wouldn't they contact us? Now, we, we've been trying to do that, have we not, in this country? Uh, well, or, or we're certain, certainly welcome uh, some kind of contact with people from someplace else. And, and if they're that intelligent to come here, and obviously they're from another solar system, they would have to be, wouldn't they? Yeah. To make that trip, you know. It's a very tough trip. The distances yeah. between the stars are enormous. In fact, to give, it, to give an idea of how difficult interstellar space flight is, take Pioneer 10. After it passes Jupiter, the gravity of Jupiter is going to eject it from the solar system. It'll be the first interstellar spacecraft of mankind. Right. It'll be the fastest object we've ever launched. It's going so fast that it's going to take it only 80,000 years to get to the distance of the nearest star. But it's not headed towards the nearest star, so 80,000 years from now, it's just going to be there in the dark of... Now, that's the fastest man-made object we have been able to come up with. And to go four and a half or 4.3 light years will take it... 80,000 years That's right. to get there. That's right. So that so if those people did come 80,000 years, uh, <laughs> be pretty old. Uh, why, in hell, why in the hell would they land in Mississippi? <laughs> uh, I mean, go to Chicago, you know, New York on a Saturday night or something, you know. Uh, wouldn't they try to make some kind of contact? What threat could we possibly be? I, I think that any society which could <laughs> travel across the space between the stars, which is so far beyond our present abilities, would have nothing to fear from us. Um, you said I, we're probably the dumbest civilization, I think, in your book, didn't you? That I said we're the dumbest civilization that can talk to anybody. And uh, <laughs> there are dumber ones, but they can't talk to anybody. And, and what I meant by that is uh, not, not this idea of, of UFOs, which I think is, uh, is really a dead end in searching for life elsewhere, but in terms of radio communication. Our present technology in radio astronomy is so far advanced that we could communicate with another civilization not any smarter than us anywhere in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And the, that's the whole Milky Way. That's 250 billion stars. That's just in our galaxy. That's just our galaxy. Then there's billions of other galaxies, of course. Uh, it's a very big universe. But what I'm saying is our ability to communicate far exceeds our efforts. And, uh, and we're just now at the very beginning in the United States and the Soviet Union to use these large radio telescopes to listen to possible signals being sent our way. In other words, there could have been, let's assume theoretically, there could have been a civilization, as you say, say a million years more advanced, mm -hmm. and have been trying for, say, a couple of thousand years to contact this planet. That's right. They may have given up, say, 30 or 40 years ago, because naturally we didn't have the capability to answer them, right? Well, and by that, uh, by their yardstick, they would say 50 years ago, well, there's nothing there. We've got nothing back. There's certainly, from that point of view, there hasn't been a thing here until about uh, 20 or 30 years ago. Right. And uh, so that's an idea of how young we are and how we've just progressed to this point of being able to perform interstellar contact. All right. Let me take a break here, and we'll be right back after this. Berkline's revolutionary new wall-away recliner could solve some of your decorating problems. One of the problems, of course, that uh, I assume um, all astronomers and sociolo sociologists thought about when they wanted to contact other people is, what do you say if you would contact them? This becomes a problem because obviously the language may be completely unintelligible. They may talk in numbers. They may talk in anything. But you realize, they, they, scientists realize that any civilization that's as advanced as ours 
uh, would know what we know, right? Binary numbers and so forth. So they put a plaque on Pioneer 10, which a lot of you are probably familiar with, that was reproduced is on a, what, anodized aluminum plate and gold plated? Yeah, that's right. Uh, with a picture of a man and woman, and the, and the man and women are without clothes, which caused quite a furor, did it not, around the country? So, uh, let, let me show you the plaque, so if you remember it. Yeah, this see. is what is on Pioneer 10, which may be, may be intercepted in a couple of million years, if it is. And by that simple diagram and the, the hydrogen Yeah, there, there's, there's, there's so an forth. easy part and there's a hard part to, to that message that, that we designed. The easy part is everything except the people. This was the interesting thing. Any civilization would understand the, the pulsars, right. the radio sources of energy. They would understand the binary numbers. They would understand the hydrogen. Yeah, the, the reason is yeah. that we share the same physics and astronomy and mathematics with anybody else who, who's able to do technology. So we think it's a lot easier to communicate with those fellows than, for example, for us to read uh, uh, the script of ancient Crete or something like that. That wouldn't mean a thing. Yeah. But, but you the said the only problem was the people. The people, because the evolutionary process clearly implies, I think, that life elsewhere, while it might be uh, more intelligent than us and have higher ethical values, be more artistic, it's not going to look like us because we're the end product of a series of uh, an enormous long chain of mutational accidents in the evolutionary process. So for the extraterrestrials, if they ever pick up this, uh, this plaque to figure out that those are the dominant life forms in this planet, it's going to be a little tough. They'll probably hold it upside down. Yeah, or, yeah. That's or right. say, or say, oh, gee, they don't wear any clothes. That's right. Look at the hat uh, on the feet. <laughs> one of the problems I think you mentioned in your book, you had the man in uh, what is accepted, I guess, in yeah, the, I read it in in the civilized world, it's a, it's a, a sign symbol of, of good goodwill or, or, or peace. <laughs> but then, if some other civilization picked this up, they might think that the right arm is permanently bent <laughs> in this position, and people walk around like this all the time. That's very possible, That's right? why we had the woman with not her hand up also. Um, and you had a lot of, uh, you had some uh, vitriolic letters about sending this filth. Yeah, don't send smut to the stars, I got a letter. <laughs> well, isn't that great? And somebody suggested, well, maybe we should put on the plaque the uh, Easter Bunny and Santa Claus at the same time. <laughs> Or the, or the Tooth Fairy, which That's might have helped them understand us a little better. Yeah, the, the, that was in response to the first objection. He said, to, to really let the extraterrestrials know how, how, how sophisticated we are, let's send along uh, uh, a stork carrying a little bundle from heaven, plus, plus Santa Claus, the Easter Bunny, yeah. and the Tooth Fairy. That would really make them understand what kind of a civilization we have. Let's assume, what is the, what is the threat? Um, a lot of people said the reason that they don't contact us, if in fact, and I have the feeling you don't believe that those uh, sightings are people from other planets, that they don't contact us because they're fearful, uh, that they're studying us, that our civilization is so far below on the scale that uh, they look at us as we might look at a colony of ants, and therefore there's no reason to contact us at all. Would that have any validity? Because they would obviously know well, to it, what degree of intelligence we progress, wouldn't they? Well, I mean, it's, a very, it's a very interesting question. The, here we are on the planet Earth, We've just, as I said, in the last 20 or 30 years, emerged into this ability to communicate. And we've been here, us organisms, us life forms, for about four billion years. The sun and the earth are going to be here for another five, six, seven, eight billion years. There are other stars and other planetary systems which are billions of years more advanced than us. Now, if you think of how much advance we've had in the last few hundred years, what will a society that's a million years more advanced than us be like? Yes. What it, no, nobody, of course, can say. But what's clear is that the, the intellectual gap, the technological gap between them and us will be enormous, and maybe as much as between us and the ants. So it may very well be that the really advanced societies aren't the least bit interested in us, and it's only the guys not too far in our technological future who would be no, interested that's in talking completely to another us. way to look at it, isn't it? We're so far behind. Uh, and you bring up what you call Earth chauvinism mm -hmm. uh, quite often, that, that we, a lot of people feel that where the, uh, we, the only yardstick we have to measure is by what things that happen here on Earth. And we yeah, get a little chauvinistic you, about it. Yeah, in, in, ev even in some scientific books, but, uh, but in encyclopedia articles and popular books, there's this phrase, life as we know it. You know, life as we know it can't be here, can't be there. And that depends entirely on who's talking. You know, who's the we? Because uh, there are some people who, who think that, you know, if any environment which is uncomfortable for my grandmother is impossible for life. And what we, what we have to realize is that life on the Earth has been delicately adapted to the kind of environment we have. And some other planet with a different environment 
there's no reason why it can't have organisms of a quite different sort that are beautifully adapted to that environment. Who was it, the scientist that wrote, uh, I can't remember the name, it says, if you look at the human body, it is not very well adapted for what it's asked to do, if you think about it. And he talked about the ears. You remember what I'm talking about? He said, if you were going to develop a device really to hear well, you would have a thing coming out of the top of your head that was a 360 degree mm -hmm. you know, antenna. You wouldn't have one on each side. And you'd have one separate organ for eating and one for breathing, like certain, I guess, animals and insects do. You instead eat instead of combining. Them. Instead of combining, and they says that the human body a lot is put together not in the best way. It, I think that's almost certainly. You'd true. have one eye, you know, that could see 360 degrees. We think that would be weird, but it, it's much better than we're built to do the same thing. The thing is, we're we're so stuck at looking at people that we think that that's the only way that an organism could uh, could be like. And there are, for example, even on this planet, organisms which have extraordinary capabilities. There's organisms which can only live in hot concentrated solutions of sulfuric acid. You put it in water, it gets poisoned. There are organisms which can only live in the absence of oxygen. You put it in oxygen, it gets killed. So, so the fact that we happen to like water, we don't like sulfuric acid, we breathe oxygen, we think it's terrific, that's just one little bit of a wide spectrum of biological possibilities. And so other planets like Mars or Jupiter could conceivably right. have organisms of very different capabilities that do fine there and that are very different from us. Fascinating. You must really go crazy with this. We, when we come back, I want to talk briefly. We had Eric Von Donegan on last night who has some far-out theories about mm -hmm. spacemen years ago visiting the Earth and uh, with some photographs that show that they were actually here and so forth. We can talk about that briefly if you'd like to when we come yeah. back. Let me take a break. We'll be right back after this brief word. about three and a half minutes. I wish we had another hour and a half. It's so fascinating. We had Eric Von Donegan on last night. He theorizes, you know, his theories. Yep. He shows some pictures that could only have been done by a super intelligent so he says. aliens that came here long ago and so forth. Yeah. My view is that, um, that every time Von Donegan finds the artifact, the constructs, the architecture of a non-Western civilization where he can't figure out how they made it, he says it had to be done by extraterrestrial intervention. Since there's a whole lot that he can't figure out, he has extraterrestrial intervention all over the world. Uh, I think that's essentially where he's at. Uh, I, th I think that's probably that and the UFO thing. It's not out of the question that we have been visited, but there's no good evidence for it. And it sure doesn't look to me like that's the way to, to spend your time. There's so many much better, much more exciting, much more fruitful opportunities right now of going to a place like Mars. For example, the United States has a program called Viking. We'll land on Mars in 1976, and there look directly for organisms. We'll have little cameras. If a silicon-based giraffe walks by, we'll see it. And if they're little microorganisms, they may be detected. That's really looking for life elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And similarly, the idea of constructing a network of radio telescopes to listen for possible signals that are being sent to us by advanced civilizations. For the first time in the history of mankind, we have the capability of performing such a search and my goodness, I think we should get on with such a search. It's, uh, it has so many possible benefits, and I can't see any possible risks. What you're talking about, when you get into interstellar distances outside of our own galaxy, which is a pretty good-sized galaxy in itself, your next nearest galaxy to make a round trip at the most advanced speed, the speed of light, would take about five million years, wouldn't it not? Something like that, yeah. So if you sent a message to the nearest <laughs> galaxy, it'd take two and a half million years to get there. 
In two and a half million years to get and back. You said, how's it going? <laughs> Which is not probably the most, uh, you know, brilliant <laughs> conversation. And you got to wait another uh, two and a half two million, and million years, years for the guy says, what was that? <laughs> and, uh, or whatever. It's not what you might call a snappy conversation. And that's a fairly... That's, that's a fair near, nearby galaxy, isn't it? Two million light years. Sure, I mean, there, there are, are some that are eight billion light years away. You see, we don't imagine that this is going to be dialogue. <laughs> They're too far away. It's going to be monologue. They talk and we listen. And that's just as well because for an advanced civilization, I don't think we have very much to say. And uh, <laughs> there might be a, just an enormous amount of new information being sent our way, passing through this room at this moment, that we don't know about because we're not yet listening with radio telescopes. A lot of people have said that and... Uh, if it was here, we might not recognize it. That's also possible. Because we're not at that uh, intelligence it, level they might be, so we wouldn't understand. But then what they would to know that anyway. really backward civilizations don't have anything but radio telescopes. So they'd drag their old radio telescopes out from the museums and say, hey, let's start to talk to the Earth guys with a radio telescope. Right. What, do you think they'll ever find any uh, constant that is faster than the speed of light, which would upset the whole uh, idea of physics in general? I know that they're some subatomic particles, and they're talking about tachons and so forth, that may travel, to and there may be an ultimate beyond Yeah, but the those speed guys can't go slower than the speed of light, so we can never hitch a ride on them. The world seems to be made in such a way that you can travel as close to the speed of light as you like, but you cannot travel at or faster than the speed of light. It's a, a, a speed limit set by nature. Fascinating. We'll be right back. Extended invitation some night uh, when you'd like to come back because we barely scratched the surface and we have some more fascinating talks to about get into the different theories which are I'd love to really boggle the mind. Thanks for being with us. Helen, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you here. Rich, as uh, usual, uh, Red Fox will be here with David Steinberg on Monday night with Steve Allen, Marsha Wallace, Peter Yarrow, and Ruth Gordon. We say good night? Yes. Say good night. Good night, Gracie. Good night.
xin chào tất cả mọi người Và hôm nay bên em lại về một chiếc Kia Morning Chiếc xe sản xuất 2018 số tự động Bản Direct Và chiếc xe này thì phiên bản màu trắng Tay nắm cửa mạ chrome này Lúc la răng còn rất là mới, đèn trước rất là sáng Morning là một trong những dòng rất là nhỏ gọn, tiết kiệm nhiên liệu và rất giá thành rất là rẻ Chiếc xe này bên em mới nhập về thì nó cũng hơi bị Vào kể ở phần đầu, có gò hàn vì vậy giá nó rất ưu đãi hơn những, những chiếc xe khác tầm rẻ hơn tầm vài chục triệu Tuy nhiên em sẽ quay tổng thể chiếc xe cho mọi người cùng xem Đó, Em thể thấy là bốn quả lốp thì đi dài dài Chưa phải thay Tay nắm cửa mạng chrome Đèn hậu thì tương đối nhìn nó chung là được Mon Linh là một trong những dòng phân khúc rẻ thì phải chấp nhận thôi Không thể nào mà đẹp xuất sắc được thì à, mô linh nói chung là xe thì còn tương đối tuy nhiên là nó bị va quẹt ở phần đầu và đã bị gò hàn rồi tuy nhiên tí em sẽ cho mọi người xem hoặc là các bạn có thể là đến trực tiếp xem xe thì các bạn sẽ nhìn rõ hơn đấy cái con này cũng khá là ok đấy em sẽ cho mọi người quay vào phần nội thất nhé đây hàng ghế trước cho mọi người xem này đây hàng ghế trước thì vô lăng đã được bọc này cần số rất là mới da ghế rất là đẹp ấy. và nói chung là tổng thể hàng ghế trước thì vẫn rất đẹp dvd tiếp học kem nùi đầy đủ nhá xe đầy đủ cam camera nùi nhá và quay đến hàng ghế sau Hàng ghế sau thì cũng rất là ra ghế cũng rất là mới Đấy Mọi người sẽ phải cân nhắc mua xe này Xe này thì nó bị va quẹt vì vậy là giá của nó là 260 triệu Nếu mà những con xe ngon thì chắc chắn là phải trên 300 Nhưng mà 260 triệu cho một chiếc xe mà Morning mà 2018 thì em nghĩ là hợp lý đấy Đấy, trong xe thì chỉ có vậy thôi Ai mua thì cứ liên hệ Nhưng mà hơn 260 triệu thì nó cũng không phải là rẻ So với một chiếc xe mà nó đã bị va quẹt và gò hàn rồi Tuy nhiên là nó cũng tiết kiệm hơn so với những chiếc xe cùng đời, cùng phân khúc Và cùng dòng Đấy Một con này thì ăn ít xăng lắm giờ sang nắng đắt thế này mà các bạn mua được con này thì em nghĩ là rất là hợp lý đi đường nội đô cũng rất là nhỏ gọn rất là tiện lợi để các bạn cứ suy nghĩ cho kỹ còn bên em thì là chuyên bán các dòng xe nỗi vì vậy nếu mà về bên em đăng và nếu mà có khách thì bên em bán luôn chứ nếu mà rất nhiều bạn trần trừ xong rồi đến lúc mà bên em bán rồi thì đấy, gọi điện và bắt đầu thì tiếc và bên em thì không nhận cọc trước cứ đến trực tiếp xem xe ưng ừ, thì chốt và bên em sẽ làm thủ tục sang tên còn nếu mà không thì thôi chứ không nhận cọc trước nhá vì vậy là mọi người cứ chủ động xem cho nó kỹ hoặc đến trực tiếp trách sau đó thì giao dịch đấy và nếu bên em mà ghim phần bình luận đã bán là sẽ không còn nữa vì vậy ai muốn liên hệ sớm thì em xin chào mọi người